process reform. Ms. Schaefel, will you please take the roll? Kalowski. Present. Kalowski, present. Wolgamot. Present. Wolgamot, present. Doubt. Present. Doubt, present. Freiburg. This remote hearing is being conducted under Rule 10.01. This remote hearing can be viewed on the House webcast. Would like to ask the legislative assistant to now take the vote. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> Freiburg, <laughs> present. Present, yes. Garofalo. Present. Garofalo, present. Haley. Present. Haley, present. Liz Lagarde? Present. Present. Liz Lagarde, present. Moran? Present. Moran, present. O'Neill? O'Neill, present. O'Neill, present. Pinto? Present. Pinto, present. Sandstead? Present. Sandstead, present. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. All right, we have a quorum. The only bill on the agenda for today is House File 1514 by Representative Sandstead. Representative Sandstead, uh, do you have a motion for us on your bill? And then will you present your bill and any amendments that you have to the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will. I would like to move House File 1514 before the committee. Uh, Representative Sandstead, I think you want a motion to move that bill somewhere. If it is the uh, direction that the chair is in agreement with, I believe this bill is on its way to rules. That's the correct motion. So Representative Sandston has made the motion. Representative Sandston, do you want to put your bill in order? I would like to do that, please. All right. I would like to make a motion to um, uh, move the DE2 amendment to put the bill in the order I would like. Representative Sandston moves the amendment. Is there any discussion to the amendment? or would members prefer, as the chair would prefer, that we put the bill in order and then we move from there? It would appear so. So all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion for the no. Rep Representative Sandstead uh, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, House File 1514 as amended is a greatly expanded version of the bill that we heard last week. Um, this, the impetus for this bill came again from my constituents that were asking for a restart plan that would uh, put them on the path to economic recovery from the impact COVID-19 had had on their businesses. Today, this DE2 is the fifth or sixth iteration of this bill. As I stated earlier, it is a greatly expanded version from the language that we heard last week in committee and reflects changes that were encouraged by many of my colleagues across the aisle, stakeholder groups, and suggestions from MDH. House File 1514 is the result of many months of effort um, of trying to create language that addresses the need for a predictable and reliable statewide restart plan that our business owners um, have asked for while ensuring that Minnesota does not lose the ground that we've gained in fighting um, the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Um, this, this language that I will present in just a moment is going to be using or referencing a site called the COVID Act Now. Um, COVID Act Now is an independent 50C3 founded in March of 2020. Data from this site comes from official sources, including the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the New York Times, and state and county dashboards. They work in conjunction with Georgetown University, Stanford Medicine, at Global, uh, Harvard Global Health Institute, just to name a few. The COVID Act Now framework, um, or I'm sorry, the COVID Act Now framework uses uh, three metrics in their framework. Those metrics include daily new cases, infection rate, and test positivity. And they use those metrics again to determine the overall risk de designation, which range um, as either severe, critical, high, medium, or low. The framework uses the most restrictive measure of those metrics as their overall state designation unless 
the daily new case is a green designation, in which case the overall designation becomes green. So onto the bill, um, or I should just say before we go on to the bill, using this site provides real-time data without the need to reinvent the wheel, which is something that I think uh, Representative, Representative O'Neill expressed as a concern last week. This is um, a framework that is in place, ready to go and reliable. So to the bill itself, section one, of the bill establishes that the Commissioner of Health, the Minnesota Commissioner of Health, will just certify the current COVID-19 risk level for the state of Minnesota using the COVID Act Now framework. Section two of the bill addresses bars and restaurants. It identifies capacity limits and a level of openness for each of the five risk categories. It also contains a very prescriptive list of restrictions for each of those five designations. Section three reflects the expansion of last week's language to include venues, which is something I think Representative um, Haley was very concerned about. The scope of my bill last week was too narrow. So this is including venues. Like section two, it identifies capacity and it has a prescriptive list of general business restrictions for each of the five categories. Section four is the inclusion of fitness centers, again, using general restrictions, general business restrictions and specific restrictions within each risk category. Section five is expanded to include uh, personal care services, which are things like tanning establishments, spas, salons, um, massage therapy, et cetera. Again, this section out, er, spells out general business restrictions and specific restrictions to that industry within each of the risk statuses. Section six is addressing pools and water parks. Again, it has a section for general business restrictions as well as specific restrictions within each category for that industry. Section seven is what I'm calling the general business restrictions referenced throughout the bill. These are things that are generally considered universal mitigation efforts, which include social distancing, face coverings, hand washings, and then there are more prescriptive um, restrictions for each category. Section eight is the language uh, that Representative Liz Lagarde has provided. This is a provision, um, an appropriation of money for payments to restaurants and bars that have had either food spoilage um, or expiration due to business closures as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Section nine of the bill just states that this plan if you will, would be in place only as long as the peacetime emergency or until the governor were to call an end to this. Thank you, Representative Sandstead. I believe Representative Lizagard, you have an amendment to your section of the bill. Why don't we take that amendment now? Would you move your amendment, please? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, the A2 amendment inserts $20 million as appropriation to the bar restaurant direct payment in section eight of the bill. Uh, this has come through working with local businesses in my district, as well as input from industry groups, such as the Minnesota License Beverage Association, and would be a reimburse reimbursement program for bars and restaurants to compensate them for the lost food and beverages as a result of either or both shutdowns uh, from 2020. And uh, I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions, uh, and I would appreciate the support. Members, questions to the Lizagard Amendment? I don't see any questions. So hearing no questions, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Nay. Motion, motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. Uh, members, do you wish to proceed with the amendments and then we can discuss the bill after all the amendments have been considered? It looks like that would be agreeable. So let's go to Representative Haley, to your amendment. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, juggling between two different committees here. Um, are we the, on the A1 amendment? 
I have it as the, I have your amendment, the DE3 amendment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, for clarifying which one that you wanted to do first. Um, the DE3 amendment uh, basically um, replaces the DE2 that was just discussed by Representative Sandsteed um, with language that this committee has seen before. Um, the, it was from the uh, bill that we discussed a number of weeks ago that Representative um, uh, Dave had brought forth to this committee. So I don't know that I need to go through that. Um, because we covered that bill before. All right, discussion to, discussion to represent, Representative Doubt. I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, you know, I think this probably is appropriate. Uh, it's this bill, um, while I appreciate the work that Representative Sanskit has done, um, doesn't really even belong in this committee. It doesn't have anything to do with Chapter 12. Uh, and I think that the committee is really eager to get a short-term solution to Chapter 12 and a long-term solution to Chapter 12, and that's what we understood uh, based on your comments, Mr. Chair, early on in the process. So, And I, and I know that we're, we're all kind of eager to have those things happen. Um, I am excited that the vaccine is working a lot better and a lot quicker than, than people imagined. Um, uh, and and uh, frankly, I think this bill could be better used by just turning it into uh, Representative Stan said other bill, which would actually uh, give the, the legislature a voice in the emergency powers. And the time for that is now. It's, it's um, you know, this is our seventh meeting. Uh, this has gone on a long time. We're in our 12th month now, I think, of emergency powers, uh, approaching the one-year anniversary of the emergency powers. Um, I think there's been a lot of frustrations on both sides of the aisle that the governor has not worked uh, with the legislature and not utilized the expertise of the legislature and not respected uh, the co-equal branch of government that the legislature is. Um, our constituents uh, can can consistently reach out to us and let us know that they don't feel like they have a voice with the governor's office. Um, that's why they have representatives. That's why they have senators. Uh, we think that that Representative Sandstead's bill uh, to deal with the emergency powers is a good one. We think it's the right uh, direction, um, and we think this is the, the right time to, to move it. Um, and while the underlying bill, uh, you know, will help help some businesses and, and reimburse some businesses, uh, we have grave concerns about um, some of the mechanisms in the bill. And, and frankly, we think that it actually uh, based on the speed that things uh, are moving, and we have states like Connecticut announcing that they're opening up next week, um, uh, you know, uh, based on the, the speed that things are moving, we think this bill could actually slow down the opening of businesses, um, and we certainly don't want that. So we think a better use of this uh, bill would be as a vehicle for her other language to get it um, to the House floor quickly, um, and I certainly would support that. Representative Freiberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a point of clarification, the DE3 amendment is the one that's before us right now, I believe, and that doesn't seem to have anything to do with Chapter 12. I guess I just wanted to make sure I'm looking at the correct amendment. I think, Representative Freiberg, that Representative Doubt's comments were about the two ways this committee was going to work. One was on those executive orders that uh, we thought we could handle and implement, and the other was on the revisions of Chapter 12. His comments were directed to Chapter 12 and the revision of Chapter 12 itself. Right, Representative Sandstead to the Haley Amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I appreciate Rep. Haley bringing this forth. I am not in favor of adopting this as it is the same bill that we heard in the committee before and there was not support for it. Um, I. I have listened carefully for many weeks now and have taken um, to heart the suggestions that have been made to me on both sides of the aisle. And as I have said any number of times, it has been my hope to use this time in committee as um, consensus building and working together. Um, I think that there's been a lot of lip service given. Um, action has been a harder thing to come to. Um, but I have listened and I have taken those to heart. I have listened to Representative O'Neill who had a concern about basically having to create a new program or a new, um, put more responsibility on the Department of Health that is already working very, very hard. I heard very clearly from Representative Haley last week 
that my bill was too narrow and it didn't really address all of the needs. So I have built that out. I have also heard from my side of the aisle uh, the need to follow the science and to um, work in a very measured way that does not allow us as a state to lose ground that has already been gained. Now, this is a very complex situation and we're working um, what may seem like a long time as five weeks uh, is actually a very short time for having to be, you know, being together and trying to do our work remotely. Um, by no means am I an epidemiologist, um, but I have reached out. I have reached out and taken the advice very carefully and very seriously from the Department of Health. I have now been in contact with stakeholder groups, uh, Hospitality Minnesota. I have been in contact with my local Chamber of Commerce president. More than anything, they are asking for a plan. They are asking resoundly for a plan. They have businesses, business plans that they need to hang on a state plan. And my bill gets us there. Um, it gives us the flexibility to move forward to a less restrictive uh, category and backwards as a, as a more restrictive category as our metrics indicate. So um, I think some of the prescriptive lists could be reduced significantly. It's my hope that we can move this bill on and then continue to work on this. I have a, a, a strong commitment to continue working on this. I don't think um, taking something that wasn't palatable earlier in terms of um, the metrics and, and a, a a safe way back and forth is the way to go right now. I still think that that we can continue to work on this, but I think we can move this out of committee today as it is. Representative Haley, I've got you next, but I will go back to you as the maker of the motion at the end also. So Representative Haley. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to um, respond to Representative Sandstate. I appreciate the amount of work that's gone into this. Um, you know, there are a number of us that have been really um, digging deep on this issue for months and months. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do appreciate um, your comments and the response to the things that you have addressed in your bill, uh, broadening it, as we talked about last week, to include, uh, you know, other venues and, and fitness centers and pools and, and to address weddings and things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm very much in, a, in agreement that you did listen and are trying to meet that need. Um, my, my chief concern is the complexity mm -hmm. um, that is in the bill, um, and that is why I introduced the DE and to go back to the Baker bill, because I think we, we have agreement on um, that these venues and these businesses all across our state need a plan, right? You use that phrase, we've been saying that for months, um, that we businesses rely on predictability they rely on um, time to you know, order product and staff, et cetera. So having a plan is something that we, we agree upon. Um, and the, the Baker bill uh, did have agreement, does have agreement with all these stakeholder groups. Uh, I know that you've reached out to them as well, but to my understanding, um, they're not in agreement on how you are using the metrics. So I think that that's where we have a divide now is the complexity in the metrics that you're using. And again, that's why I wanted to go back and, and uh, get a vote on the, the Baker bill. Um, the, the reality right now is that you know, the vaccines, we have 1.5 million <laughs> vaccinations that have come into the state of Minnesota. We have a J&J &J vaccine that's been introduced, that's been shipped to Minnesota. Um, we, the governor has even said this, um, you know, we're looking at twins games. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, we we're at a last week. I looked at the numbers, or this week, 0.05% positivity rate. Um, our 10-day average is under 3%, I think. Uh, we are in a very good position as a state. Uh, we are in a position to open up these businesses um, with the mitigation efforts that they've been using for months. Um, so maybe it's the 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 challenge here is the the confidence factor of where we're at in managing this virus. Um, so that is why I'm introducing uh, this amendment. And Mr. Chair, I would also like a roll call when we get to the point of having the vote. Okay, Thank you. roll call Everybody. has been requested. Next on the list, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I guess I, uh, 
I, I view the offering amendment um, as a as a positive thing in 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 one particular respect, and that it's um, you know inherent in this is the thought about uh, tying our actions to health metrics. And I really appreciated that Rep Representative Baker first made that move. I think that that sort of established a path um, that we uh, were able to follow. I guess I'll note uh, consistent with Representative Freiburg's point that that this really um, uh, in either way, what we're talking about is a framework for addressing restrictions on business for public health. I guess the piece that is that is um, well, two pieces that are really missing here uh, in the amendment in the original Baker language is one I'm um, as acknowledged by um, Representative Haley's point about complexity um, is to making sure that uh, that we have um, that we're kind of dealing with uh, um, the variety of situations that present themselves uh, in, in different industries um, around the state. Um, what concerns me is that uh, this amendment uh, goes in one direction when it comes to tying to health metrics. Again, I think that that's absolutely terrific, but what it doesn't do is have the potential to go in another direction if things um, turn uh, really dangerous. Um, I'm just looking at uh, a warning from, uh, uh, from the Centers for Disease Control, just pointing out that things are tenuous. Um, now is not the time to relax, uh, let down our guard. Um, and so again, it's, I think it's terrific that, uh, that the language, the underlying language here um, ties our actions to health metrics. I just think that we need to make sure to, um, to, uh, to make sure that we actually do that and that it's not simply going one direction. So as I see it, Representative Sandstead has taken this language and put a lot of work in to, to flesh out some different approaches for us to take. And I really, um, I really very much appreciate her doing that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Doe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Freiberg, for pointing out that I was speaking on the wrong amendment. I had my numbers mixed up, and I thought we had offered the the uh, uh, the, the one that I'm wanting to offer a, a little bit later. Um, but to this amendment, um, and, and I won't repeat everything I said on that one. I'll just ask you to remember the very eloquent uh, things that I said about this one. Um, but this one, I, I think, you know, I've got some concerns about the uh, this COVID Act now and that this is a you know, I, I, just pulling it up quickly in two minutes here on my on my uh, phone. Um, you know, there's four metrics that are defined um, that you know define what the overall rating is for the state, and three of the four metrics defined are in a lower category than our overall category. And it, it lists us as experts. Um, but yet, yet when you read in it, it just doesn't show that the data doesn't actually show that we're at risk of outbreak. And, and I track the data on COVID. I get a report from staff every day on what our levels are and, and on, on everything, deaths, ICU usage, test uh, positivity percentage, number of tests we're doing. I even have them average it out 10 days. I mean, it's a really in-depth thing that I created months ago. And then we just input the data every day so that I can see kind of uh, trends forming and, and what's happening. And, I, and I'm so impressed with how quickly and how well this vaccine is working. Um, but I would not want to tie our metrics to a, a website that that really, just when I look at it, they're not even averaging the, the four categories that they use to set our overall, uh, our overall uh, rating for the state. So uh, I think tying it to this would be a, a really flawed method of, of uh, um, and, and and this would go back to my earlier point that this, I, I believe this bill, the way it is right now, would actually cause our businesses to be closed longer um, or have more restrictions on them than what the real data would show. And and so I think we've missed the mark. And I, I do really appreciate, because I like the fact, Representative Sandstead, that you have looked for something like this where you can actually tie it to uh, some real data and say that, hey, when this happens, then we're going to open up. Um, I, I really appreciate that approach. I just think we missed the mark with this particular site. And and uh, I don't think this site represents where our state is at right now. Um, and, and so I have that concern. And I would definitely support uh, replacing your language with the Dave Baker language. Um, the Dave Baker language is something that he worked on for months and worked with all of the stakeholder groups. I know that they all support it. Um, and I think it would result in opening up these businesses quicker. And, and actually, I think what's going to happen at this point forward, um, because of the way the, the, uh, the uh, vaccine is working um, and we're seeing the numbers just crash so low, um, I think what we're going to see is that things are going to be able to open up quicker than we even think they are. Um, there's almost, I mean, they're talking about every 
adult in the United States having access to a vaccine in May. Um, there's almost no scenario where we're still doing Zoom meetings two months from now at the end of the legislative session. We're going to be back in person. There's almost no chance that that's, that that's not what the result will be. So what we need to do is follow the leads of states like Connecticut, who see not just where the numbers are, but what the trend is and how quickly that trend is changing in all of the data um, and, and get ahead of the curve by opening up our businesses and making sure that they're in a position now um, that they can act quickly and, and recover quickly and, and be ready for uh, the economic growth that's going to happen on the, on the backside of COVID. Um, and all of that is because of all of the good work of, of everybody, the Biden administration for getting the vaccine out, the Trump administration for getting the vaccine produced as quickly as possible, um, you know, Governor Walls for, for getting the vaccine out. Um, I'm not trying to criticize anybody. I'm, I'm trying to say that, hey, things are going really great right now. Um, let's get stuff opened up. And I, and I think we're there. So it, it's, it's time. I just don't want to put in place a bill now that will actually potentially slow things down. So I worry about the two week thing. I worry about this particular uh, mechanism in this organization's ratings that, that just don't seem to even average their own, um, their own criteria to come up with the overall rating. And I think those things could delay opening up businesses and I wouldn't want to see that. So I would not, I would not support the underlying bill. I would support adding this amendment to it and then let's push it out of here and get it passed. Thank you. Representative Graffel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, so this is a delete all amendment to a underlying bill. And so, and whether to vote for it or not, I have questions about the underlying, delete, uh, the underlying bill. Um, I can defer those questions until you've dispensed with the amendments, or I can ask the questions of the, not the author of the amendment, but the author of the bill now, whichever you prefer, but I'm going to delete all amendment, the underlying, I have questions right. about which one's better. Representative Graffalo, why don't you hold off until we finish with the amendments, and then you can have your questions on whatever the bill looks like at that point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative, I had one more. Representative Freiberg, I, yes, okay, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see Assistant Commissioner Huff is here. I guess um, I, I, I guess I would agree with uh, Leader Doubt. You know that things are encouraging, but I I don't know that I feel confident that we're completely out of the woodwork yet. Um, I mean, it, I see the numbers kind of just having. You know, I know I know total number of cases isn't always the best metric, but I, you know, I'm just looking at them over the last couple of weeks. It seems like we've held steady at like about a thousand new cases a day. And, you know, if if we were, you know, talking about this last May or June, that would be a really concerning number to where we were at that point. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering if uh, Commissioner Huff could talk about where we are in terms of the. Uh, numbers right now, because uh, you know I share Representative Pinto's concerns that this uh, amendment doesn't, you know, it contains an off ramp, but it, there's no on ramp, you know, in the event the numbers start going in a concerning direction. So I, I'm also concerned about that and would appreciate some input about what we know from the numbers at this point. All right, uh, Assistant Commissioner Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Freiberg. <clears throat> yes, so um, to uh, Leader Doubt's point, we are seeing some very helpful signs. Um, we have now over one and, and a half million vaccines out in people's arms. Um, we uh, are seeing progress there. Um, and our cases are much, much better. They have really uh, declined since our surge in uh, last fall. Um, our hospital, um, uh, folks that are hospitalized for COVID continues to decline, and our positivity numbers um, are low. We are seeing some, maybe some stalling out in that progress that we're concerned about. Um, just actually this past week, our decline uh, in case rate um, kind of bottomed out and actually started to go up a little bit more. Um, we, you know, we track cases per hundred thousand people over a seven-day rolling average. We had gotten down to, I believe, thirteen point zero cases per hundred thousand, and then we went up to sort of bouncing back up, thirteen point six, thirteen point seven per hundred thousand people. Now that could just be a bump. 
um, or it could be a trend. We don't know yet because we have to we have to watch the data. We do have a couple of areas in the state that we are concerned about. The northwest part of the state, um, so uh, specifically starting with Pennington County, but moving into uh, Rosso and uh, Kittleson and Morris and some of the uh, other counties up there, um, we are seeing incredible case growth. So, for example, Kittison County has over six times the case rate of Hennepin County right now. Um, we know that when we looked at the fall surge, it seemed to start kind of in the border areas of our state, the western border and the southern border, and then spread throughout the state. We're also seeing some concerns in the southern um, part of the state, south central. Um, let's see, I'm just pointing out. So the, the top three counties with case growth right now are Pennington, Norman, and Red Lake counties, um, all up in that northwest part. But we also have Nicollet and Brown and um, uh, Watmon. Faribault that are in the top 10, 12 as well. So we have some areas that we're concerned about. Now, these could just be rising and falling, or they could be the beginning of a, of a surge. Um, the other thing we're tracking carefully are variants. We're very concerned about variants. Um, the B117 variant, we continue to detect additional cases of that through our surveillance. Um, we're detecting some of the other variants, uh, so-called the California variant we've detected in the state. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have at least two cases identified of the P1 variant. That's one of the more concerning ones because it may um, have reduced vaccine efficacy. So I would say that we are hopeful, but we are cautious. And um, we uh, continue to track daily the numbers. And, and as I say, I think we're kind of in a, in a race of the vaccine versus the variant. Um, I know that the CDC uh, has been very cautious in urging states do not open up too much too quickly um, because we don't want to lose the progress that we have made. Thank you. Representative Freiberg. Thank you. That's helpful. Rep I don't have anyone else on the list, so I'm going to go back to Representative Haley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would just like to um, reiterate, and I could use um, Assistant Commissioner Huff's words, I think Representative Baker's language is hopeful but cautious. It uses metrics that the state has been using all along to measure this virus, and it does have an off-ramp if things uh, change by involving the leaders of the legislature and the governor. Um, so I would really appreciate your support um, on the DE3. Thank you. Representative Sandstead, final word, and then we'll go to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I still um, would not be in support of the, the DE amendment from Rep. Haley. Um, I have had a conversation with Representative Baker about the language that I am presenting today. Uh, he has agreed with me that it's very likely that we could come up with a template very similar to this specific to Minnesota metrics and not have to rely on another website. Um, we're out of time to have had that done before today's committee hearing, but I am going on record to say I'm happy to continue working with that um, as long as I have an action partner to work on that with, not just um, conversation and pointing out what isn't working, but to actually be able to do that. And, and I believe um, that we can do that if that's you know uh, the will of my colleagues across the other side. Uh, I think the framework that I have here um, is strong. I think it uh, allows us to decide whether we are moving forward or moving backwards on restrictions based on how we are, you know, how the disease is or is not progressing in the state and how we are um, controlling ourselves, you know, as individuals to help with those mitigation efforts rather than having to rely on um, a collective group of individuals to make decisions. And it, with the two week framework that I have given it, it absolutely gives the industry the, the framework that they're asking for, the, the, 
predictability, um, a plan on how to move forward or move backwards. So, um, and, and it can be done naturally. And it's, like I said, I keep going back to the word predictable. You can do this. You can look at how this is trending and know how much food to purchase or not purchase, how much staff to hire or not to hire. Um, so at this time, I would prefer to, and you have my commitment again, to continue working on this using the framework that I have presented um, rather than the DE. Roll call has been requested. Clerk will take the roll. Chair votes no. Kalowski, nay. Wolgamot? Wolgamot, no. Wolgamot, nay. Doubt? Aye. Doubt, aye. Freiburg? No. Freiburg, nay. Garofalo? Yes. Garofalo, aye. Haley? Haley, aye. Haley, aye. Liz Lagarde? No. Liz Lagarde, nay. Moran? I think Representative Moran is in another meeting. She may come back on um, once she is informed the roll calls in place. O'Neill. O'Neill, aye. O'Neill, aye. Pinto. No. Pinto, nay. Sandstead. No. Sandstead, nay. Moran. Four eyes, six nays. There being uh, four eyes and six nays, the amendment uh, does not prevail. It is not adopted. Representative Doubt, do you want to go to the, the A1 or the DE4? What's your preference? Um, why don't we start with the A1? All right. Representative Doubt, uh, move your amendment, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize. I've got a I'm a one screen person here and I got to try to look at them on a, um, so the A1, it's my understanding this uh, amendment will basically insert, uh, so it's not a DE, but it will insert um, Representative Sandstead's bill that we've talked about in the past, which does have to do with chapter 12. Um, and this, uh, you know, we believe that it's, it's really important to um, you know, get the legislature involved in the emergency orders and, and having a say in the emergency orders. So these, uh, this basically would uh, give the legislature an opportunity to weigh in and it would give a, a, a seven days to have to affirm an emergency order or that emergency order expires um, after an initial 30 days, I think is the way it's drafted. So, um, you know, this is, this is really, I think, why we're here. This is uh, not my bill. It's Representative Sandstead's bill. It's, it's, uh, you know, something that I think we would probably not draft this exactly this way ourselves. I, I have a, a bill and a version that would do something different than this. Um, I would probably, as a Republican, do it a little differently, but I, I'm, I'm trying to be bipartisan here and reach across the aisle and say, you know what, this is a good idea and it will get the legislature involved in the process. Um, and, and frankly, I think that, uh, this is really more the purview of this committee and, and what we should be doing. The underlying bill, um, well, while we also need to work on that, I, I don't personally see that as the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, and I'd hate to see that bill leave this committee without this bill attached to it. So um, I, I really do think it's important that we um, take action on what I think originally were one of the two purviews of this committee, which is to come up with a short-term uh, solution to chapter 12, which is getting the legislature re-involved in the process. Um, and then also secondarily, when we're finished with that, is to, to, to do a long-term rewrite of chapter 12. And, and I think we're all eager to do uh, both of those things, but I'd hate to let this first bill go out of this committee without addressing the, the first purview of this committee, um, which is to get the legislature involved in chapter 12. The underlying bill without this amendment will have no impact on the legislature's ability to be involved in the emergency orders, to be involved in the response to COVID. Um, and I think that would be an incredibly lost opportunity. So I'm just offering Representative Stansted's other bill as an amendment to this bill and let them both go out together. 
Representative Dutta, I believe that was House File 1515, if I remember correctly. So your amendment is more or less uh, identical or very similar to House File 1515 that we took a look at last week. I believe that's correct, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to Representative Doubt, thank you uh, for your willingness to incorporate my own language into my bill. Um, I am going to advise not accepting this amendment at this time, and the reason for doing so is that both of the issues that we are trying to address, Chapter 12 in the long haul, Chapter 12 in the short term, um, another way of saying that is addressing some of the uh, executive orders, which is what the underlying bill is trying to do, are extremely complex <laughs> issues, extremely complex. And the fact that we are now, um, our fifth committee hearing talking about this is just uh, evidence to what I'm saying. And so to add this language in, on the underlying bill, which we haven't been able to come to consensus on at this time. Um, and we really haven't flushed out. We've had only one conversation about House File 1515, and we didn't have consensus there. We weren't actually taking action, but we, we heard in that um, committee hearing that there were concerns. Um, and my recommendation is like, what? let's take care of one issue and move that on and then come back and visit the second issue, which we may be uh, closer together on, um, but they are both too complex to amend one into the other without a full discussion on it. And right now with the time remaining in this committee, we would not have the time to, to do that. Representative Doe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I appreciate Representative Sandstead's uh, <laughs> explanation there, but I, then we've got the order wrong. What we should do is table this bill and bring up your other bill and send that one out. Uh, this is, uh, well, I appreciate the work you're doing on this, and I know we've been hearing bills on, on both subjects. Um, the, the other bill and, and this amendment would add in that other bill is a much more important and pressing issue for the legislature and for the legislative process. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask that, that members would vote to adopt this. It's, it's your language that I'm wanting to put in your bill. It's not, it's not even <laughs> mine. I, like I said, if I was being partisan and trying to create problems here, I would offer my own language to it, which I have language that does a, a similar thing. Mine's a little more maybe complex, but, um, but I, I just, I felt like what you offered in that underlying or in the other bill, uh, accomplished uh, as well what, what I want to accomplish is making sure that the legislature has to weigh in on executive orders. That That is a problem that has been going on now for 11 months, almost 12 months. Um, I, I just want to remind folks, and, and I, I'm kind of shocked to even say it, that the governor has had been issuing executive orders with the full force and effect of law for one year coming up next week. Think about that. The full force and effect of law for one year, he's been able to do that. And the legislature has failed to act and failed to weigh in. Um, and, and let's not let one more meeting of this committee, which was finally set up, and I appreciate the chair's efforts to, 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 to take on these, these issues. And I know it's difficult and it's not easy to stand up to a governor in your own party. And I don't even think you have to stand up to him. I talked to him this morning. I think he's willing to, to, to have these conversations. But we, at, at least unless he's telling you something else behind the scenes, um, that's what he was telling me. And, and so let's not let another meeting of this committee go by without addressing the most important issue, which is getting the legislature involved in the process. And, and so I'm offering your idea on how to do that to your bill. Um, let's not miss this opportunity. Uh, and, and my gosh, uh, if, if, if we don't believe the legislature should have to uh, approve emergency orders, um, our next order of business after we're done with this should be just let's just get rid of chapter 12 altogether. Um, because, or then let's get rid of the legislature altogether because we don't need it. Um, and it's been very, very frustrating for everyone. And I know it is on both sides of the aisle. I, I've heard my colleagues from the Democrat side say that they are frustrated as well. Um, our constituents are not being heard. Um, and, and, and this is our opportunity to make sure that the legislature has to weigh in on that process. So let's not miss that opportunity. So please, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote on this and I'm gonna ask members to vote. Roll call has been requested. Representative Pinto to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess I'm, I'm just, I'm confused because 
um, what I feel like I picked up the urgency being is to have the legislature um, step in, weigh in, and put a framework in place so that the businesses that are facing restrictions have a sense as to certainty, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that are in the underlying, what is now the underlying amended bill. Um, I understand the concerns that Leader Dowd is, is referencing, and, and that's an ongoing conversation. But I guess I, I think if you talk to most Minnesotans, they say the um, what we need to do is to is to have something of the kind of the framework that's in the underlying bill. Um, and if the issue is getting the legislature involved, well, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, that's the, that's exactly the framework that Representative Sandstead has put together. Um, so it seems like uh, the focus, I would think, uh, Mr. Chair, um, is in fact the bill as amended right now. Um, the conversation about what you know, how emergency powers work in general in Chapter 12, um, that's an important conversation. It's an ongoing conversation. It's a complicated conversation. Um, but boy, it seems to me we, we should be, uh, in the first instance, focusing on what's in the, the underlying um, bill. And that's really what I, I, I think the Minnesotans are, are interested in. Thank you. Representative, I'm going to go back to you as the maker of the motion, and then we'll go to a vote. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I appreciate that, Representative Pinto. Uh, my, my whole point is the, the bill, if we don't adopt this amendment, doesn't even have anything to do with this committee. It shouldn't even be here. It should go to the health committees, and it should go, I mean, it should go to places where they where they have the expertise to, to look at whether we're looking at the right metrics. It should go to the Commerce Committee or whoever, you know, Jobs Committee is going to determine whether those businesses should be opened up and what the damage has been to those businesses. This committee is about Chapter 12 and about, uh, you know, making sure that the legislature has a role in Chapter 12. Um, so that's wh that's why I'm amending this bill on it. And I think it's really important. Um, and I just, I, I got to tell you, I'm really sad that that we can't come to agreement that the legislature should have a say in what has gone on for a year. And I can't believe that we can't. I, I just, I, and I know that you guys a lot of from the governor who want to get a, you know, maybe this will give them a black eye or something. This is a year. I mean, next week, it'll be one full year where the governor has been able to, with the full force and effect of law, issue executive orders. I guarantee you that nobody, including our chairman, who, who wrote chapter 12, ever envisioned that we would have year-long emergency powers. I guarantee you nobody ever thought that would happen. And that, the, that there would be things that were in executive orders in place that had the full force and effect of law for 12 months and that we can't get legislators to step up and say, maybe that's not right. This is your opportunity and, and please let's not miss it. So please vote in favor of this. Representative Dow, just one correction. The, uh, the chair did not write chapter 12. Uh, chapter 12 started in 1951. The, the even this chair was not born in 1951. Maybe this chair worked on chapter 12. Sorry, well, Mr. <laughs> I, the two sections were chapters 12A and 12B, and those are deal with another issue that is before the legislature, uh, dealing with natural disasters, and uh, now we're dealing with also uh, other types of disasters. Representative Sandstead, um, you wish to comment on this, and then we'll go to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Doubt, I, I am genuinely uh, conflicted by your statement and confused. It seems quite contradictory to me to say it's not the appropriate time to bring up the underlying bill. We should be focusing on Chapter 12. Yet, if the shoe were on the other foot and it was Representative Baker's bill, we weren't having that conversation. Chapter 12 wasn't being the priority. Um, I just want to point that out and make that clear. We are right now on the underlying bill. That is the bill that House File 1514 is the bill before the committee. I think it has to be a yes and. We need both of these. We need legislative involvement um, in response to an executive order, which is what we have been doing either through the Baker approach or through the Sandstead approach. Um, our, our language looks different, but our desire, I think, is genuinely very much the same. And I think if we can move this bill out of committee, we can get that piece of uh, a request of Minnesotans addressed. Chapter 12 still remains out there. I have no concern about the language of Chapter 12 in House File 1515. That isn't um, the, the reason that I will not be supporting this amendment. It is the complexity 
of both of these issues and the lack of a full discussion on House File 1515 to, it, it seems, hasty and irresponsible to amend it onto this at this time without flushing that conversation out. I think that could be done and could be done probably quite quickly um, once this bill is off the table and out of this committee. So I do not support this amendment at this time. Representative Dowd, one last word. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll make it quick. I, I appreciate that, Representative Sandstead. It was the majority party that decided that these bills should come to this committee. I personally don't believe this bill or Dave Baker's bill have anything to do with the purview of this committee and should never have been here. Um, I think he got advice that his should be referred here. It was referred here. Um, I think he was even going to stand up on the House floor and make a motion to refer it out of this committee um, to get it to some committees on jobs and, and, and health where it probably should be heard and where those decisions should be made. Um, but Nonetheless, uh, I, I think I think the other bill is what we should be working on. I, I don't, but I don't want to diminish the work that you've done on on either bill. I appreciate both of them. I, I appreciate the work that Dave Baker's done. I, I hope what you're hearing in my voice is just that I'm frustrated that we can't get that other bill out of this committee and get this solved. And and I mean, we're going on a year, and I, I'm just shocked that we're going on a year. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to. I'm not even going to offer my next amendment because I want to move on. Let's just get this bill out of here. Let's get it out of here as quickly as possible, and let's use the rest of this meeting to talk about your under your other bill, 1550, if that's the number, and let's get that one out of here today. Because that's all right, Representative Doubt. You broke up a little bit at the end, but I think we got the message. Um, all right. Roll call has been requested. The clerk will take the roll. Chair votes no. Kalowski, nay. Wolgamot? Wolgamot, no. Wolgamot, nay. Doubt? Aye. Doubt, aye. Freiburg? No. Freiburg, nay. Garofalo? Yes. Garofalo, aye. Haley? Haley, aye. Haley, aye. Liz Lagarde? No. Liz Lagarde, nay. Moran? Moran? O'Neill? Absolutely, yes. O'Neill, aye. Pinto? Nay. Pinto, nay. Sandstead? No. Sandstead, nay. Moran. Four ayes, six nays. There being four ayes and six nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Representative Dutt, you're not going to offer the next amendment. So we now have the bill before us as amended. And I think I promised Representative Garofalo this is where you wanted to come in. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that opportunity. And Representative Sandstead, uh, I want to start by saying that I actually think in your heart, you're trying to do the right thing. Uh, you know, you're trying to represent your constituents and you're pointing out that you you work for the people of your district. You, you don't work for Tim Walls. Uh, unfortunately, too many of your DFL colleagues view their job as working for Tim Walls. So my first offer to you is you should ditch the DFL caucus and come join our caucus where you can actually fully represent the people you work for. You don't have to tolerate uh, this stuff. Um, but with regards to your underlying bill, and you're a good person too, so I think you and I, a smart person, uh, I'll tell you the story privately, never mind. Uh, so getting back to your underlying bill, Representative Sandstead. Um, so may versus must, right? Big difference in that. Is there anything in this bill that the governor couldn't do right now that he needs this bill to become law to do? Representative Sandstead, you wish to respond? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Garofalo, I don't know that uh, for 100% certain, I would imagine, uh, if I had to take a guess, he probably could. This bill isn't written for the governor. This bill is written to put a framework in place for businesses to go to to understand how to plan. That is the purpose of this, um, and that is what we're pushing for. And um, 
that that is our role to respond to our constituency. Um, that is our role to make policy to the best of our ability to make people's lives better. And that is what I am trying to do through this bill. Mr. Chairman and Representative in the so in the language that's listed right now, this was brought up by a previous um, colleague of ours. Would this actually prohibit the governor from loosening things up more if you want to? Or does, the, does this advisory or does it actually set a floor that would prohibit him from loosening these restrictions? I believe, yeah. Mr. Chair, thank you. I apologize. I believe that he could continue to loosen restrictions. Um, I also believe that this bill uh, will loosen restrictions based on the data, based on the science that is coming from Minnesota. And this goes back to a comment from Representative Doubt earlier, the metrics that are built into this website, two of the three are the same of uh, the same metrics that the Department of Health suggested suggested to us in a previous hearing. The third one, um, I think I have some questions around whether it is the same, similar, um, identical, or if there's some significant differences in that. Um, but the science should be the science should be the science. The numbers should be the numbers should be the numbers. And um, I'm not trying to recreate the wheel. I'm just, I'm, I'm operating under this framework because it is already established. Okay, and Mr. Chair. Representative Grosso. Thank you, Representative Sanstead. So, um, and, and thank you for saying that about the science and the data, because I do think it's important to point out that um, these lockdown procedures, um, there are costs to these that go beyond the COVID costs. We've seen an explosion in crisis, um, in event, crisis mental health incidents. We've seen a jump in drug overdose rates. We've seen an increase in suicide rates. Yet those metrics are not included in the COVID Act Now site. Am I mistaken? Representative Sands. Those specific metrics are not. To, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, and Mr. Chairman. Representative Grafo. And Representative Sanstead. So that's that's obviously um, two concerns I have on this. Um, I do think, again, I wanna say this generally, you're, I believe that you are being torn in two separate directions right now because you're, you are trying to do the right thing. You recognize where this is going. You rec recognize where your constituents and particularly those in Northern Minnesota wanna go. Yet uh, too many members of your party um, are oblivious to this. Uh, the situation, mean, the crisis portion of fighting COVID is over with. We are now in a state of caution. In the state of Minnesota, we're now at a point where a supermajority of those 65 years of age and older are vaccinated um, or have, have natural immunity. So the vaccination rates are at like 58% uh, natural immunity combined with vaccine rate, vaccination rates, 75 to 80% already. That account, that's the pool of population that counts for 90% of our deaths, the majority of the hospitalizations. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what people are waiting for other than for Tim Walls to say it's okay to do things. And that's the frustrating part for this member. So uh, I'm not gonna be, uh, I'm not gonna engage in the dog and pony show today. Uh, I'm not gonna engage in the performance art. I just wanna thank you, Representative Sandstead, for doing what uh, I know that you're trying to do as much as you can, but your colleagues are limiting you. And again, the door is always open over here. You're welcome to join us. I think you'd, you'd be a great addition. So that's it, Mr. Chairman. I'll be, uh, I'll be voting no on the bill. Representative Dowd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, uh, Representative Garofalo is right. Uh, the, the bill would tie the governor's hands. And if, if um, and, and this is a, a, the, what I meant when I said this could actually delay the opening of businesses. Um, if you think about the fact that two months from now, every adult American is going to have access to a vaccine. And we have, uh, you know, vaccinated uh, or, or distributed 1.5 million doses of the vaccine here in Minnesota. We have, uh, you know, 50% of our population over 65 vaccinated, um, along with a lot of our teachers, healthcare workers, frontline workers. Um, we have, we, we have reached a critical point where um, our numbers are, are crashing. And I, you know, I appreciate uh, Assistant Commissioner Huff coming on and, and giving a very uh, uh, thoughtful um, uh, approach to his testimony each week. Um, 
but uh, the reality is, you know, and, and it's always switching, right? Um, well, you know, this week it's, it's what we need to be concerned about is the total number of cases. Um, well, you know, the total of number of cases is going to be tied to uh, the to number of tests that you've done. And I can look at the test data to see how many tests have been administered. And I can see this, the spike. In fact, if I can pull it up here in two seconds on my screen, I'll hold it up for you because it's, it's kind of comical that the, the number of, you know, for, for months, it's been the, the test percentage. And that's what we've been told is, is the data mark that we need to watch. Um, today, we're told it's, well, there's a high number of cases. Um, and and the, the reality is, if you look at the, the, the number of cases, it might directly correlate to that spike you see at the, at the side of that graph, which is the fact that um, this last week they did about 100% more, more tests than they had the previous week. So, you know, that might say that you'll find uh, a few more cases. But the reality is the test positivity percentage, which we've been trained to watch for months now, uh, for a year, um, that number has not spiked. Um, and, and in fact, that number has continually gone down. And, and so it's, it's important that we actually watch the data and that we don't scare ourselves. Um, there, there is a, a, a scenario here where um, with this language, it will tie the governor's hands. This will put into statute a reopening. Um, we're gonna tie that to a website, which I can point out right now, the data on it is flawed. They are not even following their own data and setting the overall risk level for the state of Minnesota. So that would need to be changed uh, before we would wanna put this into law. Um, and then we require every two weeks, okay, things are happening right now in Minnesota faster than every two weeks. Um, and every two weeks, they'd have to reassess this and every two weeks they'd make a determination based off this, what we now know as flawed data on this website. Um, and, and that will dictate whether they can reopen. Um, that will be in statute if the Senate were to ever pass this, which they won't. Um, and if the governor were to sign this, which he probably wouldn't either. Um, the governor can open the state faster than um, this language uh, would allow him to um, if the numbers continue to show that that should happen. So. Um, if we pass this, and if it did get through the Senate and it did get signed into law, the governor would not be able to open up the state faster than this uh, language would allow and faster than this website um, would allow. And the website, uh, as you know, and you can look at it, pull it up in two seconds and look at the criteria for Minnesota. It lists Minnesota as overall high risk. Um, and then three of the four categories of our ratings are in medium risk. So they're not even averaging our, our, the risk categories to get to our overall category. They're just using high, um, and, and that's based on the overall number of cases, um, not any of the other three criteria, which we are in the medium category for. So, and by the way, these numbers are changing exponentially quickly, um, and, and this whole thing's gonna look much, much different two weeks from now. So it's time to open the state and it's time to open it now. This bill will actually delay the opening of the state. Um, and and uh, and that's not something we should be doing. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, I find myself bewildered. If, if things change rapidly in two weeks, then the data from COVID Act now will say that. And remember, this is a national, uh, well-respected site. I haven't heard any specific um, concerns about it. It's not controlled. We want to make sure it's not controlled by the governor, not controlled by anybody else. It's national data. In two weeks, then I guess if things are looking really good, then now we're down to the green zone and then things open up. Like that's the whole point of the structure that in fact was originally from the Baker Bill. Again, I want to thank him for the idea of having health metrics tied to actions. What this does is this then says, actually says, let's make sure that we actually follow through on that. Um, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm really confused by the objection, even the idea that um, the governor could do something that was outside of this. I thought the whole point of this is the, we want the legislature to act. This is the legislature acting. The legislature saying, here is what we want to have happen. Boom, we have it happen. If things continue in as good a direction as they have been, then per the mechanism created in the Sandstead bill, things open up. We didn't want to have it be, we looked at the Department of Health, looked at the governor to do that. Okay, fine. Um, I'll admit I, I don't appreciate the, the, the aspersions that some of us are not working for our 40,000 constituents, because I certainly am. Um, and, uh, and the fact is that what we do is we, we, uh, we have a framework that's created by uh, Representative Sandstead that the legislature then approves that we then follow through on and we're not relying on the governor at that point. Um, and uh, and if we think, and I guess I would really encourage my colleagues as this bill does go to other committees, Leader Dowd made that point before, be referred, reviewed by health, commerce, et cetera, 
um, please let's get into looking at the details of this. If you think that the COVID Act now numbers are resulting in restrictions under the framework, resulting in restrictions that are too restrictive, given those numbers, given what Representative Garofalo referenced, because of course there's a huge cost in having businesses be closed in the ways they are and everything else. Well, let's take a look and make some adjustments, propose that. I know Representative Sands said to be very open to those discussions, but let's actually get into the details and look at it and figure that out as to how the mechanisms should work. But the fact is, um, uh, the CDC director, we're not talking about the governor or anybody else, is saying, quote, things are tenuous. Well, now is not the time to relax restrictions. We need to be very, very careful. Represent Sandstead has set things up so that as the data shows that we are in a safer area, boom, the restrictions are lifted in a very timely basis. I don't think you could do it more often than every two weeks. We want to make sure that we have the certainty so the businesses can plan. That's the whole purpose of this structure. So, um, uh, Representative Sandstead, thank you so much for doing this. I know you've been pulling in uh, thoughts and ideas from all over. And members, please, if we could turn our attention instead of this broader issue, bring up a lot of a lot of these other points, let's look at the actual framework. If you think that something's wrong with one of these levels or with particular restrictions on a particular kind of business, talk to Representative Sandstead, bring an amendment. Let's look at that. Let's make that happen. But you want the legislature to be um, in position, in a position of authority. This is it. This is our chance to step in and make these restrictions work in a way that will keep Minnesotans healthy and balance all the things that we have to do as policy. Policymakers. Thank you, Representative Sandstead. And I, I will vote in favor. Representative Sandstead, final word, and then we'll go to the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I just want to clarify um, some of the things that Representative Doubt, sorry, I'm raising my hand here, had raised as being flawed data on this website. I want to be very clear in saying this, this data is updated daily and draws from Minnesota data. As I said in my opening comments, these comes from much of this data is coming from our own dashboard. So, and no, uh, Representative Doubt, you are correct. There isn't an average. And on the website, they make it very clear they're using, out of a sense of caution, the most restrictive measurement of the three metrics that they are uh, measuring. Those three metrics, again, are the same three, two for sure. One is a question mark um, of the metrics that MDH recommended we use if we were going to put a plan like this together. MDH, and I know that Dan Huff had to, um, or Assistant Commissioner Huff had to leave the call or leave the meeting at this time, but he had also suggested to me in the three metrics that he suggested, we also use the most restrictive of the three um, as an overall rating, not an average. So um, that is how the the COVID Act Now site is set up. It isn't flawed. It's it's. I, I think maybe as you had looked at it, you might not have seen they spell it out very closely or very carefully on how they determine their uh, overall risk. They have more than three metrics as well. They're just saying the overall risk was based on those three metrics. And I want to thank Representative Pinto for so succinctly stating um, it is really th the framework that we are going after right now. Uh, Representative Baker had looked at this. He gave me uh, verbal feedback that he felt it was too complex. And I can't say that I'm in 100% disagreement with that at all. Um, we could simplify this. And I am on the record saying I am willing to do that. But I, I need... I need an action partner to sit down and do this together if we're going to get it done. And I believe that we can. So at this time, I'm not going to be, um, I'm in support of the bill as amended. And I appreciate everybody's time. I know that, again, this is a very complex issue. I appreciate your feedback. I welcome your ongoing feedback and my door is open if you would like to work on this with me further. All right, members, uh, Representative Sandstead renews her motion that House File 1514, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Rules Committee. Clerk will take the roll. Chair votes aye. Walowski, aye. Wolgamot? Wolgamot, aye. Wolgamot, aye. Doubt? No. Doubt, nay. Freiburg? Yes. Freiburg, aye. Garofalo? No. Garofalo, nay. Haley? No. Haley, nay. Liz Lagarde? Aye. Liz Lagarde, aye. Moran? Aye. Moran, aye. O'Neill? O'Neill, no. O'Neill, nay. Pinto? Aye. 
Pinto, I. Sandstead. I. Sandstead, I. Seven eyes, four nays. There being seven eyes and four nays, the motion prevails and the bill is on its way to the Rules Committee. Representative Dowd. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to respond to that comment from Representative Sandstead, but uh, you know, the, the data is actually flawed. If you look at the first metric, which is the one that they risk us, that they say we're in the high risk category, that's 14 deaths per 100,000 people. If you multiply that times 56, which will get you the number of deaths per 5.6 million people, which is our population, um, that gets you to 784 positive per day. I want to read to you the positives that are actually reported by MDH um, in the last uh, week or so. There isn't a 784. There's only one day in the last week or two that it's higher than that. Um, but yesterday, 376, the day before, 663, 799, 312, 373, 717, 676, 679, 732. I mean, it, there's only one day that's above that. If it, I, I, I don't even know where they're getting that number. Um, it's certainly not off of our data. So, um, you know, I, and, and that's the one that is flawed, and that's the one that they're using to set us in a high-risk category, which is the difference between keeping our businesses at 70% or at 90%. Um, so, you know, and I, I, my hope is, and I, I'm sure you agree with me, that, that things move a lot quicker than this. Uh, my hope is that, that we'll see these numbers crash even more before we get to the House floor with this bill. Um, and that we'll just get things opened up because I think that's the right thing to do. And, and my hope is um, that we can spend the, the time in this committee um, working on chapter 12 and, and fixing the, the wrong of the fact that the legislature hasn't been to weigh, weigh in on, on these executive orders and that they've been, some of them standing for a year now. So um, th there are some flaws in the data and there are certainly, you know, I'm sure they can say they're doing a 10-day average or something, but that doesn't even work. The seven-day average doesn't work. None of their numbers work to get to the number they have on their website, which has us triggered at the highest. Um, and I watch this data pretty closely every day. Um, and, and I'm very impressed with how quickly our numbers are coming down. And, and, and so, and everybody gets credit for that, right? Everybody who's wearing a mask, everybody who's been keeping their business closed or, or you know, staying home and quarantining and all of those things. But the fact is now we're getting people vaccinated. We're, we're vaccinating our highest risk people. Um, it, it's time to get things opened up. Um, and, and we're only going to see these numbers continue to, 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 to get better as we vaccinate more people. Representative Wolgamont, do you have a motion for us? I do have a motion, Mr. Chair. I would like to move the approval of the minutes from February 26, 2021. Representative Wogelot moves approval of the minutes. Is there any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion prevails. Minutes are approved. Representative Haley. Representative Haley. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us some direction on where, as committee members, we should be spending our time um, next week and preparing would, um, for. I, I would add, I would be preparing at the next meeting to discuss the elements of uh, House File 1515 and what we are going to do with the revisions of Chapter 12 itself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you? I did some um, research on how many bills are currently in the House uh, addressing the current COVID emergency orders. And I counted, and I can share this if you want, there's 50 bills. Uh, one of those has been in, enacted that was related to House File 114, Representative Moeller's bill related to COVID judicial deadlines. Um, two of them have moved through a committee and are, and are going to a different committee. 47 of them have had no action. So I, I really question the majority party's commitment to do any work on these emergency orders and uh, feel like we're just running out the clock here. And I'm, I'm wondering what, what your direction then is, will we be able to work on the emergency powers and the emergency order bills? Do you plan on, do all these 50 bills have to come through this committee or these bills uh, sit where they are in, in the first committees that they were directed to? Representative Haley, I share your fascination with the number of bills that are always introduced into the legislature. 
The last legislative session broke another record at 4,695 bills that were introduced in the last legislative session. It also broke another record. It sent the least number of bills, 97, to the governor to be signed. So when we're looking at the number of bills being introduced, I agree with you, there are too many bills and we deal with too few. I couldn't agree with you more. And taking the slice that you did is an illustration of my point. There are too many bills and we have too little time. So I, I'm in full agreement with you, Representative Haley. I wish members would not have to put every thought that crept into their head introduced as a bill. So I, our next meeting uh, will deal with uh, chapter 12 and the revisions of chapter 12. Uh, and hopefully we can come to a consensus and move that forward. And with that members meeting is adjourned.